Welcome everyone to the Rotary Club of Greenville. It's so good to see each and every one of you here. My name is Scott Stevens and I will start off today by having our prayer and pledge. So if you'll join me by standing, let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for the opportunity to speak through Rotary. Help us to make a positive impact wherever we are. We pray for peace, for wisdom, for discernment as we work to make this city and this country a better place for all people to live. We pray for our elected leaders that you would guide and direct them and that they would make decisions that would be best for everyone. We pray that for those who are charged with protecting us, both here and abroad, that you would keep them safe from harm. And we pray for their families, that you would provide peace and comfort while they are separated. Thank you for our time together. I pray that as we seek to promote peace wherever we are, that you would bless our city, our state, and our nation, and bless everyone here as we seek to serve others for your glory. Amen. Join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon. I'd like to take a minute and welcome our visiting Rotarians and, and guests. Um, as I call your name, please stand. Sean Savage, guest of Rance Bryan. Mark Gilman, guest of Benny Kreider. Rebecca Duncan, guest of Bob Howard. Ross Clements, guest of Bob Howard. Gina Blome, guest of Bob Morris. Larry Murphy, guest of Marie Murphy. Jessica Pinion, guest of the club. Matt Irwin, guest of Scott Powell, and Alicia Redding, guest of Pam Weaver. Thank you, and welcome to our club. Good afternoon, I'm Beth Paget. I serve as District Rotary Foundation Chair, but in this capacity, I also serve as our Club Paul Harris Fellow Coordinator. And I get to talk for a few minutes about my favorite subject in the world, which is um, the Rotary Foundation and Paul Harris Fellows. And we're about to get a PowerPoint up. So while Connie's doing that, uh, Connie uh, Lanzel, who's um, multi-talented, did a wonderful presentation two weeks ago about the Rotary Foundation and also about um, some exciting giving opportunities for our club. And so we're gonna talk about those in just a minute. But um, one of the things Connie mentioned uh, two weeks ago was uh, every Rotarian every year. And this is something that Rotary asked, but it's also a goal of our club this year is to have everyone give at the, e what is called the e level, which is $25 minimum in the year to the uh, Rotary Foundation annual fund share. And so let's take a look at just a couple numbers. So far this year, we have 125 members that have given at least $25 to the Rotary Foundation. Last year, we ended the year with 171 who have given at least 25 to the foundation. Both of those had a starting point of 221 members for the beginning of the year. So you can see we've got a little work to do. One thing that I noticed uh, in doing some of my district work that has not been shared with this club, and this club does an excellent job both with corporate memberships and with family memberships. To be an E-Ray club, both all the corporate members and the family members have to give at the $25 level for the club to qualify as an ERA Cub. So just keep that in mind as we go finish up this year. So we have, as Connie mentioned two weeks ago, an exciting opportunity, uh, February, but also breaking news. I'm a former newspaper editor, so I like to do breaking news. This has also been extended through March. 
And that is a boost to the next Paul Harris level, or maybe just your first Paul Harris, where we as a club are going to use recognition points to help you become a Paul Harris fellow faster or move to the next level faster. And so this is Connie's slide. I cannot do anything this complicated, but this is how it works. If you have already at the $1,500 level as uh, giving to the foundation, and you need 500 points to get to Paul Harris plus one, this is how it works if you wanna take advantage of this special. You contribute $250 and the club will match 250 points and you have become a Paul Harris plus one. Uh, that is a great way to get to the next level. And again, this, this deal, this matching point deal runs February and now March. Also through the end of the year, we are matching, uh, giving 100 recognition points to anyone who brings in a new member. So keep that in mind. Lots of ways to move up to the next level of Paul Harris giving. And you ask, why is this so important? Why do I care about this? First of all, the Rotary Foundation has the highest level of ratings in terms of how it uses your dollars of any uh, foundation in the country. It's an extraordinarily good, efficient, safe, and also effective way to give to support charitable causes. But also, in an in a equation far too complicated to explain, um, but you'll have to take my word for it, when clubs give, to uh, annual fund share, that is used as a way to, uh, on the district side, for us to decide how to give district grants. So generally speaking, the more a club gives, the more a club is eligible for in terms of a district grant. Uh, just keep that in mind. But also, the Rotary Foundation's motto is doing good in the world. And we don't, we don't give, I don't give just for bling, foundation bling, or even just because of the match. I give because I know what our foundation dollars are doing in the world, and they are doing extraordinarily good work in the world. <clears throat> For example, from the beginning, our club has been a, a lead sponsor in our work in Haiti. Uh, Charles Warren and Glenn Warren lead the project, but we have given more than $100,000, I think, as a club toward the Haiti project that now we're entering the third year of the goat breeding farm. So whether you know it or not, you all own goats in Haiti. You don't have to go feed them every day though. Somebody else does that for you. But the good thing about this project is that we have moved in Haiti in the central plateau, the Conj area. We have moved beyond simply giving people sustenance to sustain their lives we are now doing through this an economic development project where families can start to build wealth through owning goats, giving some of the little baby goats back and continuing a cycle of building wealth in Haiti. So that's one thing to keep in mind about your foundation dollars. Another thing, our club has been a key sponsor for water projects in Honduras. This is life-saving work. We have now completed 18 projects in Honduras as a district. Uh, about to finish, uh, on the left side, we're about to finish the 19th project, where we go provide the resources, the financial resources, but we don't do the back-breaking labor. The people in those villages that are benefiting from our water sanitation projects are the ones who do the back-breaking labor to build a, a trench line from a source in the mountains all the way down to a village uh, below that water source. They cut through mountains, through rocks, whatever, two miles, three miles, six miles of work, just like you see, so that they can, one, bring water to their village, but also save the lives of children, so many of whom were dying because of um, unsafe water sources that these villages were depending on. So take pride in that. Also, <coughs> through our Rotary Foundation work, Polio Plus, not annual fund. We have been a, a key giver to Polio Plus since it was uh, since Rotary entered this initiative in 1985. You see two of my favorite people in these photos. They went on a trip to India a few years ago. We are through those two drops that Terry and Pam gave to those children in India 
they were able to start uh, making that country polio free. When we started, 1985, there were 350,000 cases of polio, wild polio virus a year. Last year, there were five. Unfortunately, a tad of bad news right now. We have had our first case late last week in Malawi. Uh, it was a case traced to Pakistan, uh, and they are not going to count it against Malawi is the tentative ruling from the World Health Organization. But we are literally this close to eradicating polio in the world, and that's through your foundation giving too. And then finally, how many of you have participated in some way, shape, or form at Alexander Elementary School. One of my favorite Rotary projects ever. And we use, I mentioned district grants, we use our district grant to help fund this project. This year, we are using $3,000 of a district grant matched by the club. Next year, our club has access or is eligible for $7,000 in district grants. And I bet you a large part of that is going to go to Alexander Elementary School. So that's just a little bit about what your foundation dollars go for. I hope you all take pride in it. I hope you feel satisfied. I hope you understand the extraordinary amount of good you're doing in the world through your foundation giving. So now, so we're going to recognize our Paul Harris, uh, our new Paul Harris fellows. So when I call your name, Come up, President Ramona is going to give you your, your pen. And um, then we ask that all of you stay here for just a second, and we're going to take a group photo, if you will. So, Paul Harris Fellows, these are people who have given either $1,000 or they have a combination of gift, monetary gift, and matching points, but they are joining and getting the coveted Paul Harris Fellow pen to note, to note that they are now a member of the most honored society in Rotary, the society that shows people who are, have, have given to the Rotary Foundation. So our first one, virtually, Lucy Henry. And so she's not going to pop in, but I'll make sure Lucy gets it. John Allen, who is getting his plus one, meaning he has given or had matching points to help re, uh, reach $2,000 in giving. And he's recovering from foot surgery. That's right. So we're, we're at John's excuse from being here. Uh, Penny Robbins, uh, who is a relatively new member and is plus one and plus two. So you've gotten two extra awards at one time, Penny. Thank you so much. And just, just hang around for a second, please. And then uh, Chris Manley, I got an out of office from him when I sent him an email this morning. So I don't think Chris is here. But Chris is uh, plus two and plus three also. Penny, you may be the only one in the photo by the time the day is over. And then uh, oh, Ramona Farrell, plus three. Uh, Elizabeth Lyons, plus four. Jane Dyer, plus seven. And Chuck Welch, who is plus eight. So thank you. A round of applause for all our either new or going to an extra level in Paul Harris giving. Uh, and while Amy is getting a photo, I was asked to tell you about a, an anonymous Paul Harris fellow that is being given because the person doesn't want public recognition. And it's one of the rare times that a Rotary Club, but also one of a very appropriate time that a Rotary Club recognizes someone who is not a Rotarian. Um, at uh, the Kringle Holiday Village, wasn't that a great, great fundraiser? At the Kringle Holiday Village, we had someone sign up through the online portal uh, as a volunteer. And um, she likes to do community work. And so she worked all day Thursday and you know, I think it was freezing rain and cold and just Yucky, yucky weather. She liked that so much. She came back Friday and Saturday and Sunday. And so she's not a Rotarian, should be, because she already shows that she puts service above self. So uh, the rec um, uh, Jane recommended that we make her a Paul Harris fellow. I think we're going to get it to her at some point. Uh, but she did everything, stayed from beginning to end, 
and actually serves as a role model for many of us. I put myself in that group who sometimes, um, sometimes complain when you do a little too much rotary sometimes. But when we notified her that we were making her a Paul Harris Fellow because of her volunteer work, she said she doesn't like public recognition. She just loves to serve people and that she appreciates it, but she really just doesn't want to come out and get an award or have us recognize her publicly. So just know that uh, sometime in the very near future, our club is making someone a Paul Harris Fellow who, despite not being a Rotarian, puts service above self in her life and also at Kringle Holiday Village and serves, again, as I said, as a role model for us. <clears throat> Finally, although we're now having to do this virtually because Lucy Henry could not join us today, uh, I'm going to take a minute and talk about the Paul Harris Society. You get a lot of Paul Harris stuff when you start talking about Rotary. Paul Harris was uh, the founder of Rotary International. The Paul Harris Society is for people who give $1,000 a year and then commit to giving $1,000 every year after that. Something comes up financially, we understand. We don't send the Rotary police after you. But this is an extraordinary commitment that shows how, what these people believe about the foundation, about our work, and about how we can do good, change lives, and in many cases, save lives throughout the world through our contributions. So our first time in a quite a while, Lucy Henry has become a Paul Harris Society member. And I will make sure she gets the Chevron and her special certificate uh, for doing this. We have 10 people in our club eligible for the Paul Harris Society. We have three that have completed their um, giving this year. Uh, we've got two or three more who will join this list very soon. I've talked to them. And then we have several people who have given at $1,000 at least once in the past three years. And I am uh, notifying them and working with them about whether they want to continue uh, that make that commitment to Paul Harris Society. It is a great way to give if you have the financial means. It's a great way to really um, increase your ability, our club's ability to do good in the world. So thank you very much for the time. And um, remember, our match is being extended through March. And also, if you bring in a new member, you're eligible for 100 recognition points. So thank you, everyone, who um, got your Paul Harris Fellow or Plus One. It's a pleasure and an honor to serve with such a giving club. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon. I'm Tavia Gaddy, and I am coming to you for the Peace and Conflict Resolution Conference which will be hosted this year by the Rotary Club of Greenville and Rotary 7750. It is Thursday, May 12th at the Greenville Convention Center from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. And this year's theme is Finding Peace in a World Full of Conflict. It will feature Dr. Shamini Jain, psychologist, founder, and CEO of the Conscious and Healing Initiative, as well as Zachary Brewster, Senior Pastor of the Changing Church, Tyler Rex, Executive Director of Thrive Upstate, Greenville's oldest and largest disabilities services provider, Dr. Edward Anderson, who is the Executive Director of On Track for United Way Greenville, and ready for the video, Reverend Deb Richardson Moore. Hi, I'm Deb Richardson Moore, and I'm the former pastor at Triune Mercy Center, which is a church in town with uh, outreach to homeless parishioners. As I was reading what some of the other speakers on our panels are talking about, I noticed that a lot of it was unconscious bias. And I would argue that perhaps our bias against the homeless are, is more um, conscious than perhaps the others. But, and I think that stems from fear. When we see someone on the street and he or she um, is dirty or might not smell great or reeks of alcohol 
or is perhaps being aggressive in, in the behavior, um, that can be frightening to a lot of people. And so I think we just tend to, to want to push them away or, or at worst, give them a few dollars to, to make them leave us alone. What I found in my years at Triune was, was sort of a very different reality. A homeless man once said to me, Pastor, do you know the worst thing about being homeless? It's not being hungry or wet or cold. The worst thing about being homeless is being looked right through. And so that was the basis for all of our ministry at Triune. We were trying to look. We were trying to touch shoulders and make eye contact and give hugs and do everything we could to make people feel that they were noticed, acknowledged, and loved. So I think that, that until we get to that place in our society, we are not going to solve homelessness. So join us as we look, acknowledge, and give even more love, service above self. Registration is $45 per person, $25 for students. And sponsorships that are greatly needed are, they range from $99 all the way up to $2,500. You need additional information, Dr. Judith Prince will be more than happy to give that to you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, I'm Ryan Thackeray here to deliver the member news. We are a month behind our member news, so apologies to those of you that submitted membership news back in January. Uh, so we'll be covering some January and February, February member news today. And good news, we've got a sponsor. She paid top dollar for this sponsorship. Today's member news is sponsored by Rotarian Susie Tumblin, Carolina Lifestyles Personal and Executive Assistant Services and Real Estate Agent. Susie is a realtor with Keller Williams, but she's a different kind of real estate agent. Whether you're buying a new construction home, a new to you home, investment property, land acreage, multifamily, or commercial property, Susie will ensure that you get the best realtor for your needs, even if it's not her. Yep, you heard it right. If it's outside of her expertise or requires a specialist, she will find the best licensed real estate, real estate professional to suit your needs. She works with some of the industry's top agents in the upstate and has a network of agents across the USA. Whether you're buying or selling, she gets the job done. And hey, here's what gets even better. When you work with Susie as your real estate professional, you will receive concierge level service. She'll retain your confidentiality while providing effective communication throughout the transaction. And as a native of upstate South Carolina, she has an incredible network of professional contacts to help you smoothly navigate every aspect of the process. Movers, surveyors, attorneys, stagers, and such, she's got you covered. Now, here's where it gets even better. Susie, your fellow Rotarian, wants your business, and she will give 15% of her net pre-tax commissions to Rotary Charities when you choose to use her in 2022. This includes any clients you Rotarians refer to Susie as well. The last time a Rotarian chose Susie as their realtor, there was a donation of $1,376 made to Rotary Charities for educational programs at Alexander Elementary on behalf of this Rotarian. This is how you make a difference. And she would like to challenge any other real estate Rotarians to match this challenge. And let's raise as much cash as we can for Rotary Charities in 2022. Bring it on. That was a long one, Susie. We're really going to have to invoice you for that, I think. I'll have uh, thank you for that. It's good. How my people call your people. All right. On to our more news here. Thank you for the sponsorship and for that kind offer to Rotarians with the match there. Recently, GSA Business recognized the success of 25 area leaders who wield tremendous professional influence while also making a difference in their communities. The 2021 Women of Influence honorees represent fields ranging from law and nonprofits to real estate and architecture. They are honored with awards and recognition on December 9th at the Commerce Club here in Greenville. Among those recognized included our very own Rotarian, Yulita Austin, president of USNS. Cheers to her leadership and passion for excellence and service and for her impact on our team and our community. I see Yulita here today, but congratulations, Yulita. And Jordan McKee, everyone's favorite volunteer for Rotary Charity Fundraising Events, has some exciting news. After nearly a 10-year career with Mass General Store, Jordan has decided to start a new adventure, join the Berkshire Hathaway real estate team. 
Jordan's last day at Mass was on February 11th. Congrats to Jordan. Good luck on your next adventure. And perhaps the saddest news is that none of us can no longer name drop Jordan at Mass General and hope we get a discount. So pay full price next time, folks. Uh, Rotarian Ryan Thackeray. This dude sounds cool. He was recently selected for a fellowship uh, with my employer, the Nature Conservancy. And as a part of this fellowship, I'm working with colleagues from across the globe to plan and participate in the World Water Council's ninth annual World Water Forum in Dakar, Senegal. I'll be departing for my adventure to Senegal in just a few short weeks to work with other nonprofit organizations, as well as the international community and government leaders, to declare that there is no water security without ecological security, and there is no ecological security without water security. As I was telling some friends at the table earlier, I spent the last two and a half years quarantined on the east side of Greenville, so it's a heck of a first big trip for me, um, but so excited to head over to Africa here in just a few weeks and uh, certainly do my best to make our Rotary Club proud over there. And we have an update for you from Dr. Judith Prince on the Service Above Self Scholars that each of you have had an impact on supporting our Rotary Club and our scholarship program. Here is your recap. On December 10th, Jaden Gale Beek, 2019 Rotary Service Above Self Scholar, graduated from Southern Wesleyan University, summa cum laude. She completed her degree in a year and a half because the number of hours she earned through dual enrollment in high school at Greenville Technical College. She immediately entered a graduate program in counseling at Southern Wesleyan. She'll be working with the One Life Institute at Southern Wesleyan, which is a special gap year program providing growth in faith, leadership, and serving others, and in the admissions office during her master's degree program. 2017 Rotary Scholar Reed Howe will graduate from Clemson this semester with a Bachelor's of Science in Industrial Engineering. He will join General Electric's Operations Management Leadership Program starting in June. It's a very prestigious leadership program at GE. He will participate, he will participate in three eight-month rotations where he will do different jobs within the company at different sites. You might remember Kendra Witt, our 2016 Rotary Scholar. She graduated from Wake Forest University. Are they going to go, go deacons there, Bob? with a master in accountancy. She is a tax accountant at Ernst & Young, one of the big four accounting firms in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we also have Ellen Featherstone. Y'all remember Ellen, 2014 Service Above Self Scholar winner. Ellen's a gem. She uh, graduated from Clemson University and was the Rotary Club's very first Service Above Self Scholar. And she went immediately into the Peace Corps. She was assigned to the Peace Corps in Malawi with the onset of COVID, all Peace Corps volunteers were brought home, which was traumatic for Ellen because she felt she's leaving the people of Malawi when they needed her most. Since returning home, though, she has been in Charleston, South Carolina, working at DHEC on disease surveillance and taking courses to enter a physician's assistant program this fall. Ellen is engaged to David Baxley, who graduated from MUSC Medical School and who will begin residency in ophthalmology in the fall. They'll be married in Greenville in April and will continue their education, hopefully together and both hope to work internationally someday. And then let's not forget, last but certainly not least, 2015 Rotary Scholar Casey Stevenson, a member of the Rotary Club of Greenville, making an impact at the Greenville Literacy Association and right here in our club. So these are the stories behind what Beth was talking about earlier. We're up here asking for donations all the time. It makes an impact. It has an impact on local students that go on to have an impact in our community and communities beyond, and quite frankly, can't think much better there to a better way to invest in folks and invest in, in people that are making a difference. So please continue to support those students and support our Rotary Charities. A few other final words of uh, membership news. Greenville County Treasurer and Rotarian Jill Kintai was awarded Order of the Palmetto by Governor McMaster on February 7th. Congrats to Jill on this highest honor that is well deserved. And how about Jim Poss Parham was awarded the South Carolina Bar Foundation Durant Distinguished Public Service Award. The award honors a lifetime in the law marked by integrity, character, and active pursuits to ensure justice. Weiss said that Jim's accomplishments are extraordinary, but even more impressive are the wisdom, curious intellect, good humor, collegiality, and faith in humanity that are so ingrained in Jim. Jim has been at Weiss for 62 years. I thought it was a typo. I double checked. That's true, though. And I'm not seeing Rob. Is Rob Rowan in the building today? Did he not make it? All right, well then, Rob's going to have other news to share with you all at a different time. That is your member news for February. If you have member news or if you would like to sponsor member news, we've got a good rate going on for March and April. Just email me, find my information in DACDB, and hope everyone has a great rest of your day and week. Take care.
Thank you. I'm going to talk about our next meeting. It's going to be March 8th. And uh, well, I'm sure Dr. Jenkins' act was a hard act to follow. <laughs> we do have an interesting program for you that I think you're going to enjoy a lot. First, the event will be held at Rewa's newly renovated Operations and Training Center, a space large enough to assemble the entire Rewa crew in one place. The building's across the road from the main office at uh, Malden Road and I-85, and it was a 1939 Works Progress Administration building that they've completely redone. I think you'll enjoy it. Secondly, unlike most of our social events, this is a social event, and it'll be 5.30 in the afternoon. Unlike most of our social events, we do have a speaker, one who is one of the great storytellers on earth. Is someone we've been trying to get to Rotary for the past three years. He was scheduled for November and uh, got bumped by the district governor, which was okay. But finding time that we could fit him in has been difficult. He is Bob Dotson. Um, so who's Bob Dotson? Bob joined NBC News as a correspondent in 1975. His long running series, An American Story with Bob Dotson, ran on the Today Show for almost 40 years. His work has earned Bob some 120 awards around the world, including 10 Emmys, a Senate Grand Prize for the Best Documentary, top awards from the Kennedy Center, the DuPont uh, Foundation, and six Edward R. Murrow Awards for Best Network News Writing, and induction into several national halls of fame. Last fall, Bob won his 10th Emmy uh, for writing and narrating the real Bedford Falls. It was a tribute to the 75th anniversary of It's a Wonderful Life. It was about Seneca Falls, New York, where Frank Capra wrote the original story. Bob did 1,200 American story pieces, and they are all, all, they are all now available online. There will be a link to the collection and some specific and one specific story for the club to review in uh, our newsletter this week. Is our speaker here? Hey, <laughs> let me uh, let me just yield the floor. the The meeting will be at seven p.m. Uh, I mean five thirty to seven at the Rewa headquarters. Welcome, Miss Jacobs. This is Dr. Jenkins. Um, I kind of did your brief intro and well, then I just MIA. Okay. No concerns? Okay. With that, yeah, welcome great. to our club. Great. Well, thanks for having me today. I did finally make it. I, uh, I still feel like a new Green Billion. I've only been here about uh, two and a half years, but two of those were pandemic. So, I still get the points at club and the points at hotel mixed up. Has anyone else done that? Make me feel a little bit better? Okay. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you. I want to thank you for the invitation to be here and to talk about Greenville's medical school. So how many in the room know you have a, a four-year medical school before you saw me as a speaker? <laughs> so, Okay. Um, so when I came here in, uh, in 19, after following Jerry Yuki, uh, I realized that not a lot of people actually knew about our school. We were hidden, and I think we're the best kept secret in Greenville. Um, I had read about Greenville, and I read the book about Greenville, building the best downtown in America, and I thought, that city is on fire, and they must just love this medical school. Do you know what year Greenville wrote a feasibility study for this for a four-year medical school? Yes. Any guesses? Okay, 1964. So 1962 was really close. Um, and then I believe that feasibility study, which was partnering with Furman, actually gave Columbia the idea to do a four-year med school. 
which is why their medical school is 50 years old. Um, but Greenville doesn't give up. If I've, if I've learned anything about um, Greenville, we don't give up. And so there was an opportunity and Greenville Health System really wanted a medical school. And so they came up with, um, now I'm from Texas. So I, <clears throat> so I happen to know that people do handshake deals in the back room. And I think, <clears throat> I think what happened was that we had people um, sort of saying, well, Clemson will support it, <clears throat> excuse me, if Clemson will support it or if an MUSC, uh, then Greenville can have its medical school, except you won't get any state appropriations. So we're the only privately funded public medical school in the country and remain so until today. So we are celebrating our 10th year anniversary. So your medical school is 10 years old this year. So we'll be doing a lot of celebrations. You'll see that starting in the summer. Um, we started with 48 students in the first year class in 2012. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dick. I also have South Carolina allergies, so thank you. Um, so, uh, and now we have 427 students across four years. Uh, with our sister school in Columbia, we graduate about 850 medical students, future physicians. So what brought me to Greenville? I was in Washington, DC. I was working at the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, they asked me to come for a year to work on some research and health policy. And they borrowed me from my university in Texas. And that one year, they kept asking to borrow me for another year. And finally, after four years, they offered me a job. Um, and, and I said, no, I really need to get back to academia. So I enjoy teaching. I enjoy research. Um, I have built the Laura Bush Institute. Uh, I can tell you that story sometime later about going to the White House to pitch the idea to Mrs. Bush. Now, I'm, I've never been to the White House. I grew up in Appalachia, like the eight of eight children. So I'd never really been there. So those, I had had a phenomenal career and I had a lot of fun and I was blessed because God always puts me where I'm supposed to be. And so when this job came up, we were actually heading back to Texas and someone sent me the job. Actually, it's my husband. Does anyone know Steve in here? Anybody met my husband? Who else? You know that he's a little sneaky after 30 years. He did not want to go back to Lubbock, Texas, and he wanted me to be a dean. And I had been groomed to be a dean uh, for most of my um, career by uh, the dean and Texas Tech. And I had said each time, I'm never going to be the dean of a medical school. They never looked very happy. And so I had a lot of great happiness in my career. And I didn't want to spoil that. So um, there were 27 open dean positions in the country. So deans don't have any job security either. Another reason not to be a dean. And um, so out of 155 medical schools, there were 27 openings. And I applied to one. And the reason I applied to this one was because God had two people email me and the search firm call me. And he was like, so you might as well listen and apply. And I did. And... Um, when I came here, I, was, I fell in love with the school that you guys built. We accept the best of the best students. We accept students that live in rural South Carolina. Probably never thought of going to college, much less um, medical school, much like myself, living below poverty. Some slept in their cars, were homeless for a time. And these young men and women are tenacious and they are resilient and they make the best doctors in the world. I am certain of that. I also uh, came because the medical school grew up out of a healthcare delivery system, Greenville Health System, over 100 year system, and now Prisma, and merging two 100 year old systems in a state that is one of the unhealthiest states in the country. So we track about in the bottom 10 to 15%. And I just saw they put out new uh, life expectancies by state. And we're also in the lowest for life expectancy. So people in, uh, so if you want to live eight more years, you need to move up to the Northeast or to the West Coast. <laughs> uh, so 
it really drove me to um, want to be here and want to make a difference. First, I didn't, I wanted to make a difference for the students. I wanted to engage students that never thought they would have a chance to be a doctor. I was told many times, I'm too poor to be, uh, to go to medical school. Um, and so I didn't want that to happen to our students. I also love the idea of working out of a big healthcare system and trying to make, create a better state of health for South Carolina and working um, really toward that, moving the needle for our communities. And so that's really how I came to be here. And I gave you some cards. My card is there. You feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, but I gave you some, some statistics. Our school, this school is amazing. And when I um, went out nationally and said, hey, I've been offered the dean position in uh, University of South Carolina, Greenville. And they said, um, oh my gosh, that school's so great. It's so innovative. It's so technologically advanced. We're one of four Apple schools of distinction in the country as a medical school. We have a 99% match rate for our students that go on to residency. Now, 5% of students nationally don't have a job after match day. They don't have a residency slot. So that's a, that's a big deal as well. We meet or exceed all the state standardized board um, uh, scores and graduation rates. So we are sitting in a really good place when I took over as dean. So when I took over from Jerry Yuki, the school was already great. So coming in and people would ask me, what's your vision for the school? And I would say, well, your school is wonderful. This school is wonderful. Um, but I really wanted to do a couple of things while I'm here as the dean. Number one, I wanted to create some infrastructure to help the population to be healthier. And I wanted to raise scholarships for our students. So our students end, many of them, with $200,000 in debt. Now that doesn't count their undergraduate. And uh, my husband and I were just talking about our first house cost $74,000. <laughs> um, and so I don't want students to leave burdened with debt. It's hard to convince students to be a family medicine doctor uh, in um, Oconee or Toomey uh, when they're gonna make one of the lowest salaries as a doctor in the country. Cardiovascular, orthopedic surgery, those are dermatology. Those are more um, attractive. And they've got to pay these loans back and some spend 30 years paying loans back. And I don't think our students should do that. And, and people said, oh, you're from Texas. Texas has so much oil money. And South Carolina, uh, you won't be able to raise scholarships for, uh, I'm like, what? This town is welcoming. There's so much philanthropy, there's so much generosity in uh, the upstate. And I know that we can do that. I know that we can raise more scholarships. And so that's one of our big ideas that we're gonna be launching later for our 10th anniversary. And we're gonna ask leaders like yourself to help us create the next decade for this medical school. What do you wanna see from your medical school? What do, you, what do you expect us to do when we look back in 10 years and we want to have achieved X, Y, Z? So I want to hear from you. I want to hear what those thoughts are. And I would love uh, for you to spread the word about your medical school. So I'll tell you one more little story. When I came in, when we moved here, we were in the 05 and uh, went to Harris Teeter and we were just checking out. The young lady heard us talking about the movers. And she said, oh, uh, you're new here. You moved here. Yes. Well, why did you move here? Well, of course, my husband, who is so proud of me, like really proud, um, he put my medical school grades on the refrigerator. That, that's what he did. Yeah. I did graduate first in my class, so he was really proud of me. But um, he said, oh, my wife's the, the new dean of the medical school. And she goes, why are you shopping in Greenville? Don't they have a Harris Teeter in Columbia? I, was, I had no idea. Um, so then I did just a little exercise. Every time I would go somewhere new, like to get our uh, oil changed or to uh, the hair salon, or I would just say, do you know you have a four-year medical school? No. And I've been introduced as everything. Executive director, director. Um, I'm a teacher at the medical school. 
By the way, I was right in what I thought. Deans do not have a lot of fun. They, they do not let me, they don't let me teach. I have a master's in education from Johns Hopkins. Um, and I taught there for four years. And it's really interesting. But really, I'm a resource office. Um, and, and I had to kind of shift my expectations of what I thought I should be doing with my career to what I knew God wanted me to do with my career. And so for that purpose, um, it took me about six months to say, I love my job. I love this school. I love this place. I never disliked it, but I just didn't know what it was going to be. And right when I got comfortable and, started, and stopped drinking from the water hose, the pandemic hit. So God has a sense of humor as well. And so that's really where I, uh, people would ask me, do you love your job, your new job? And so for the first few months, I would say, it's exactly what I thought it would be. Smiling, just, you know, yeah, it's exactly. And then um, I got to know our students and I got to hear their stories. And I got to know Greenville, so welcoming by uh, Green, Greenville uh, to Steph and myself. And um, that's when I could say, I love it. So now I can authentically stand up here and tell you, this is the most amazing opportunity that I've had. People think it's founding an institute for a first lady. And, Ms. and I love Mrs. Bush, but this is really the best job that I've ever had in my career. And I want to, when I do leave it, I want, and I'm not planning unless someone has plans for me, um, but it, I would like to leave it better than I found it. I don't care if you remember Marjorie Jenkins' name. Don't need my name anywhere on a plaque or anything like that. But I really would like to leave it better than I found it and know in my heart that I helped some young men and women get to and through a career that they never thought they could have or afford. So I will stop there. And do we have time for one or two questions? Oh, certainly our Columbia, our sister school is a traditional medical school built and embedded in a big flagship university. And that's where I was in Texas. Um, this medical school is innovative because we grew up from scratch and, ten, and we, we attracted people. Half of my faculty have never taught as a, at a medical school before. They taught at Furman uh, undergraduate schools. Um, and we have uh, faculty that win international and national teaching awards. So I tell people that we're sort of the rebel medical school. And we're small enough to be agile and quick, but we're big enough to make a difference. So that's how I would, I would say that. Was there another question? I don't know if we have any that did after they um, graduated, but I know that our, I, our students are very much engaged in giving back. So they spend thousands of volunteer hours in the community. So we're just building our alumni base database because we just, we now have seven classes that will have graduated this year. Well, I will say that, um, so I'm the chief academic officer at Prisma as well for the upstate. And I will say that Prisma has a lot of capital um, projects planned for this year. Uh, Marco Halla, who's the CEO, uh, he la landed two, year, two days before I did. So we oriented together and I got to know him uh, well. And again, he was here for six months and then the pandemic hit. So lots of things were put on hold. Um, as we were really navigating that pandemic. And I wanna share with you guys, having a, a system with 12 hospitals and hundreds of clinics is the reason why we never had to turn anyone away for um, care. Prisma uh, really took care of the community across two thirds of the state. And um, every day they have 8,000 learners in their environment, 8,000 from high schoolers up to my med students. Um, and they don't charge a fee for that. And so that is a lot of giving back to the community. You may not hear the good stories about it, but um, I can vouch for them. So I anticipate there's a, you'll see a lot of capital improvements across the enterprise over the next year or two. Yeah, so I'm gathering that data, but I can tell you the percentage that stay at Prisma for residencies. 
since our first class, and it's 15 to 30%. We really would like to have 40% of our students stay. And we definitely want them to stay and go to our med school and stay, because we know if we do that, 75% of them will stay here in South Carolina. We are 700 primary care physicians short in the state. That equates to about 3.6 million visits. South Carolinians will have difficulty scheduling. So we do need these primary care doc, uh, programs and we are launching an accelerated family medicine program in our medical school. So it'll only be three years of med school and then they'll get out a year early. So we're trying to help by doing that. I will take the last question. Oh, and so in our primary care accelerated track, these students will be going out to residency programs in the rural areas that we've set up. And then we're hoping to get them to settle in those communities. They will get a full tuition and fee scholarship to be in the primary care accelerated track program. And so we, and if they don't fulfill their criteria of working four years at Prisma after that, then they'll have to, that'll turn into a loan not a scholarship. So we are encouraging that. And um, we are also admitting students that live in those rural areas, right? Because they want to go home and help their community. And so there's different ways that we're trying to, to put those doctors in those rural areas for sure. So I apologize again for running late. Um, I want to thank you for your attention and for your invitation. You have my card, reach out to me if you want to come and take a tour, gladly give you a tour of our school and let you talk with some of our great students. So thank you very much. Uh, so Dr. Jenkins, uh, we partner with Alexander Elementary School um, here in our community. And with each guest speaker, we make a donation to their library. So on behalf of the School of Medicine Greenville, I'm going to ask you, lift. yep, you know, it's called Lyft and she actually, you know, <laughs> if you'll, there's a pen at the table. Yes, the I would and be honored we'll to that. do that. What so, a great thank thing you. to do. Thank you. And thank you All for right. being with, here with us. So glad you found us. <laughs> So, so glad our speaker. So hopefully you understood why Bob and I were so excited about having Dr. Jenkins come, right? Having heard her over three years ago and just the presence of the school in our community. Um, and they were, what was it? Transforming one doctor at a time. I think our Rotarians helped transform the world one Rotarian at a time, right? And making a difference. So with that, I want to, we want to recognize our members who've been bringing guests um, to our meetings over the last month. So it's, Walker, you have that look on your face that says, I want to make a drawing. Stay seated, Rance, it's not you. He's won like four times already. So we have a public gift card and it'll go to Bob Howard. So Bob, here you go. That's why I met him halfway across the room. No, no. Uh, so we do thank all of our guests for coming today. Uh, hopefully this has sparked your interest in our club and your desire to hopefully become a member. We do have a Discover Rotary meeting. If you haven't attended those, they're in person and also virtual. Either speak to the sponsor who brought you today, reach out to Michelle, our executive director, or anybody really in this room. And we'll help get you situated with that, as well as sharing um, an application to become a member. So a couple of just more updates. Uh, so George, thank you for giving us the update for our social on March 8th. It should be fabulous. I'm actually going to be in Tennessee, so I'll be missing that event, but that's life. Um, Alexander Elementary is having its Read to America on March 2nd, and Amy's right here. We have only two slots left, yes? So if you... Yeah, it's been great, right? Good response, but two slots left. So if you have that interest and desire, um, please see Amy. And then the foundation giving, right? Very important. We are on our way, but we still have a lot of work to do before June 30th. So please consider, right? The $25 minimum, whatever you can do. And then also remember about our Paul Harris Fellow matching uh, and let us help you get to that next level. 
Um, with that, I think I've covered everything. So if we stand, we'll close with our four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concern? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concern? Thank you for attending today.